Cabernet tends to be the sort of Errol Flynn of the grape variety. To meet a legend of Australian wine. Shiraz, more powerful, more structured, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Great single malt whiskey is made in the brewery. Conventional winemakers who just condemn all natural wine as faulty. Exploded onto the Australian brewing scene. Natural winemakers, what we strive to do is match the variety to the area. Start focusing on the main ingredient in beer, which is water. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson, and this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Hi again, everyone. And this is a very special episode of the Drinks Adventures podcast as we are joined by the influential wine critic, Jancis Robinson. In 1984, Jancis became the first person outside the wine trade to qualify as a master of wine. She was awarded an OBE in 2003 by Her Majesty the Queen, on whose cellar she now advises. But Jancis may be best known for her hugely admired reference books. She is co-author of The World Atlas of Wine, editor of the Oxford Companion to Wine, and co-author of Wine Grapes. Jancis was in Australia recently to launch the eighth edition of the Atlas, recognised as the essential and most authoritative wine reference book available. It was a privilege to sit down with Jancis for this extended interview. But first, a word from our sponsor. Now, I'm no brewer or distiller, but I have a fair few friends in the industry who are, and I know where they go to source the ingredients they need to make the wonderful beers and spirits that we all enjoy drinking. I'm talking, of course, about Bintani. With experts in all categories on the team, Bintani understands how brewing and distilling ingredients work together like no other supplier. Bintani handpicks the best. Jancis Robinson, thanks so much for joining me on the Drinks Adventures podcast. It's a great pleasure. This is the eighth edition of the World Atlas of Wine. Now, what is involved in creating a new edition of this book? You have to go through every sentence, every paragraph, every map and update it. And the world of wine has been changing so much and so rapidly that that has been a major job that has kept me really busy for two years. In fact, for two years, rather ironically, I haven't been able to travel nearly as much as I like to because I've been too busy <laughs> assembling all the information on this, the world of wine. Uh, we do have consultants around the world, 68 of them, who feed in their thoughts about how things have changed. But as, as a measure of how much have changed, um, some poor person in the Foreign Rights Department, because this is a book that sold uh, millions of copies and it's gone into 14 different languages so far. But for foreign rights purposes, she had to count up how many new words there were. And she calculated that 45% of the words in the eighth edition are brand new. So that's it's more than a cosmetic revision. And you're ably supported in Australia by Hugh and Hook, I believe? Yes, although Hugh and, funnily enough, made the smallest proportion of changes. Perhaps we got it so right in the seventh edition, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> the first edition was released in 1971, so there's been a new edition roughly every six years. Do you think there's been a window of time in which the wine landscape has changed as much as it has between the last two iterations? I don't. Uh, I, in fact, I devoted one of my Financial Times articles the thesis of it was, I have never known the world of wine as so, so much in flux as it is at the moment. And part of that is the changing shape of the world of wine, how climate change has extended the, um, the map of the vineyards towards the poles and up the mountains and so forth. But perhaps even more interesting philosophically is that whereas in the 90s, Everyone around the world was trying to make the same sort of wines, which were basically copies of France's most famous ones. You know, and they were all growing Cabernet and Chardonnay and things like that. And they were chasing points, so they were making deep-coloured, alcoholic, often rather oaky wines. Nowadays, there is no one idea of what good quality wine is. And you've got the whole new... Natural wines is at one end of the spectrum. People are making, in general, much fresher wines and more geographically expressive wines, which is great from the point of view of an author of an atlas. But, you know, there is, there is as many different notions of great wine, uh, almost, as there are of consumers now, where, which is much, much more exciting, but it makes it quite 
challenging to get it all into a book. Now you've touched on one of the trends that's covered in the new edition being natural wine and also orange wine I believe you've explored. They've really swept the globe incredibly quickly haven't they? They have and in a way that's very healthy because I think what it shows is that wine is of interest to a younger generation but who want to have their own wine, their own put their own stamp on wine. So the, the natural wine movement is, is very different from what you might call conventional wine. And I think if the natural wine movement hadn't come along, it might have been the case that a whole generation of potential wine drinkers would have been rather turned off by wine. It was something they associated with their parents and it didn't really move on at all. But it, it's a, a movement that is substantially owned by younger wine drinkers, which is not a bad thing. What about you? When you see a natural wine on a wine list, does that entice you to order it or is that possibly a deterrent? <laughs> it's neither. And I would look first and foremost at the name of the producer and try and get a handle on whether I think it's going to have been well made or not. Sadly, I have come across a lot of badly made natural wines. And for instance, my colleague, Julia Harding, a fellow master of wine, went and spent a day with Bordeaux's Centre of Wine Academe the other day. And the, the people she met there said virtually, we have no truck with natural wines. We're very worried about natural wines. We think a whole new generation of wine drinkers is being educated on the basis of faulty wine, and then they're not getting a decent education. They're getting a, a misconception about what, how wine should taste. But of course, I got the impression that few of them had actually tasted natural wines, and they just automatically assumed that the, the one or two poor quality ones that they tasted were like all of them. I'm more, much more open-minded, and I, I do like well-made natural wines. I don't like wines whose only selling point is that they're natural and they aren't actually good. I think the proportion of well-made natural wines is going up all the time. But there is this particular compound which is associated with low sulfur, which is one of the attributes of natural wine, which to me smells like a kind of hamster cage or mice or something like that. And apparently it's a compound that a third of the population can't sense at all. So my theory is that a lot of the natural winemakers are in that third of the population and aren't being put off the wines by this smell because they just physically can't smell it. For me, the sad thing about natural wine movement is the polarisation, that you've got these conventional winemakers who just condemn all natural wine as faulty uh, without perhaps investigating very hard. And then you've got the naturalistas who think all conventional wine is evil and um, never the twain shall meet. But what I hope, because I know that conventional wine producers are using fewer and fewer additives in the winery, fewer and fewer nasty chemicals in the vineyard. So the, na the conventionalistas are going in the right direction. And I hope that the standard of winemaking among the natural wine producers will continue to go up so that eventually they will meet in the middle and we may actually eventually dispense with the term natural wine and all wine will be more quote unquote natural than it is today because that will be the healthy development. Do you think there still is an overuse of additives and intervention in, in traditional winemaking? The sort of wines that I come across, no. I'm writing, especially on JancisRobinson.com, I'm writing for people who are seriously interested in wine. And that's pretty much all made by people who desperately care about quality, who in the 40 years I've been looking at the wine scene have dramatically decreased additions. And as I say, both in winery and cellar. Um, I don't know, I haven't sat in a winery producing millions of bottles of, uh, of mass market stuff. I don't know what they're using. And they probably are using still some additives I wouldn't like. And I, particularly in, in um, America, they're kind of adding colouring and that kind of thing. But that's at the very bottom end. And I, I do think everything is going in the right direction. And that even, even the most um, mass market orientated grape grower is using much cleaner, 
methods than, than used to be the case. What are some of the other changes in the uh, Atlas, the new edition of the Atlas? Certainly shape of the wine, of the wine world. And the sort of, you know, Germany now, which when I first encountered it, uh, struggled to ripen the grapes and used to have had acid levels that were so high they had to chuck in grape juice to sort of sweeten the thing and compensate. Um, last summer was so warm that they actually had sunburnt grapes, which would have been unthinkable um, a couple of decades ago. Uh, we now have decent wine being made in England. Uh, we can be proud of our sparkling wine. High acid is an attribute in sparkling wine. <laughs> Um, Canada is now, has now got a thriving wine industry, even on the, in eastern Canada as well as in, in British Columbia. Um, so the whole style of wines has been changing. Um, and I've completely rewritten the introductory sections because weather is, has been changing. Weather is such an important influence that I think the whole... Uh, subject of whether needed to be sort of re-sliced and, and re-presented. And we've got, for instance, a couple of pages on climate change specifically, for instance. What do you think has been the impact of climate change on Australian wine so far? Not always beneficial, the way that uh, it has been in cooler parts. And uh, it's been very interesting to see this reassessment of grape varieties, because I think this love affair with you call them alternative varieties. Alternative varieties. Uh, widening the scope of different flavours you get is very healthy. But of course, some of that is being driven by the need to plant grapes, vines that can tackle higher, higher temperatures. So it's interesting, like McLaren Vale planting all these Portuguese and Spanish varieties. So, you know, people sometimes say to me, people who are had a life in wine, a bit like me. Uh, oh, I, I got into wine by tasting Mouton 45, you know, one of the classic great wines of Bordeaux. And I feel so sad that the prices are now so high that young people coming to wine will never ever taste those great trophy wines or whatever. And I say, I don't think that matters because nowadays there is such a wide variety of different wines that I think any newcomer to wine is bound to find something that, that they will like. And it's not the case that everyone has got to like this rather narrow choice we used to have of, of the French classics. What about those who want to become scholars of wine, as you have, though? You, you um, became an MW in 1984. Do you think that that challenge has become much more difficult, though, given the lack of accessibility to some of those wines? I think nowadays the, the Master of Wine examiners fully realise the breadth of wine available and it would be very mean of them. I mean, you're never going to get a Mouton on 45 given to you blind in a, in a Master of Wine exam. You might well be given a, a, an affordable red Bordeaux. I remember when I, just after I passed the Master of Wine exam, I think they usually pick out someone who did well in the tasting to, to lecture the next year's students about tasting and I had to do that and in fact it was when Michael Hillsmith who became the first non-British master of wine very soon afterwards was was studying for his MW and um, I said the one thing you can be sure of is that you'll never get a Bordeaux first growth in your exams because they couldn't afford it and as if to prove that there was this great gulf to preserve anonymity between educators and examiners that following year, they gave them three vintages of Lafitte. Just <laughs> uh, but I don't think they would now. And I know Lafitte wouldn't give them the samples either. So I think it was a sort of rather historic... That was when you could actually afford a Bordeaux first growth, it, it, almost. No, so I, don't, I, don't, I think that's OK. I, think, I do think, though, that the exam is more difficult to pass nowadays. It's not the case that the, the Institute of Masters of Wine want to make it more difficult. They, they want as many people as possible to pass and they'll, they'll pass, they could pass 50 people in one, one year if, if they met the standards. It's not the case that there's a certain number of MWs to give out. But the world of wine is so complex now and what they're trying to do, I think, is keep up the standard relatively. I was really lucky to take it in 84 because then 
Australian wines tasted Australian. California wines tasted definitely Californian, you know. Whereas now, it, take a barrel fermented Chardonnay made anywhere in the world, there are very small differences between some of them, aren't there? But isn't the, you know, the, the role of terroir and, you know, winemakers looking to ex express the local terroir, hasn't that been more of a recent trend? It has, and I think it's a very healthy trend, and, and I'm delighted by it. But I think uh, in the panic of, a hotel, of a, an exam room, because the Master of Wine exam is, I think it's five written papers, three practical papers, as they call them, and in each of them you get 12 glasses and you don't know what's in them. Um, I, think, I think it would be a very tough examiner who said, um, tell, tell us the vineyards these, these wines were made in. They might say which region. And that would probably be fair enough. But my point is, the regional differences are less pronounced today than they were in 84. Everyone travels and everyone sort of knows which techniques are being used around the world or in the classic regions and are trying them on at home. I read a quote from your publisher in your column that very few book publishing projects on the scale of the Atlas are still alive. Do you think that books still have the same importance today in the world of wine as they once did? I think some books do. Uh, I'm thrilled when I travel around the world, I meet people who th really think they know me and have a relationship with me because they've studied the Oxford Companion to Wine and or the World Atlas of Wine. And wine is a, is a fascinating subject which seems to attract more and more students. The WSET, the Wine and Spirit Education Trust, celebrated its 50th anniversary with a dinner in London just before I left. So the WSET educated 100,000 wine students last year around the world. So that's pretty impressive. And yes, for wine students, I think books have a, a great rev resonance. I love it when someone brings me a battered old book with kind of lots of post-its in it, you know, that, to sign that they've obviously found really, really useful. We actually have got digital versions of both. Um, the Oxford Companion is on my website in a digital form, and as, as are the maps from the World Atlas of Wine. And the World Atlas of Wine, whenever it's published in print, nowadays has an iPad version as well. But there is something about paper and a book that looks good. I mean, nowadays, I think, to make books compelling to buy, they, they have to, to look and feel really nice. And perhaps it's no coincidence that our new jacket is very tactile. You can run your fingers over it and, and get some pleasure. This episode of Drinks Adventures is supported by Fever Tree Premium Mixers, the mixer of choice in the world's best bars and restaurants. Right now, I'm enjoying Fever Tree's Mediterranean tonic for a more delicate touch on some of the fine Australian gins you've heard discussed on the show. What do you make of the current media environment surrounding wine uh, generally? I, I mean, I don't know what it's like in the UK or in other markets, but certainly the amount of space that newspapers are devoting to wine uh, in Australia has absolutely plummeted. And I'm not seeing that really being replaced by new media. Do you think that's a concern for the industry? I think it is a concern, and it's happened in the UK too. I feel very, very fortunate to have a full page in the Financial Times magazine, and in foreign editions, it's kind of half a page of the, the newspaper version every Saturday. Maybe it's because there isn't the advertising to support it. I, I actually get quite a bit of fine wine advertising around my column. Um, because it's not that people are drinking less wine, uh, or maybe we haven't made the subject interesting enough to earn our space, I don't know. Um, you say that it hasn't been compensated for in other media, but aren't there, isn't there really a plethora of blogs and online? Well, there was, but I can only think of a handful that have really survived because, um, you know, there wasn't a business model behind most of the blogs and people eventually tire of sort of spending... Charity. Yeah, spending that much time um, devoting their lives to something that, that doesn't have a financial return. Well, it's, I started JancisRobinson.com sort of by accident in 2000 and I found it such fun, but I was devoting so much time to it that I thought... 
I think we're going to have to have a subscription section, a members section of it. Not all of it, still about a third of the articles are free. And so I launched um, the subscription bit of it in 2001. And by mistake, it got launched, on, put online sort of for half an hour before we meant it to go there. And in that half hour, we got three memberships, one of which was in Brazil. <laughs> And so we thought, huh, we're onto something here. And actually, to my amazement, it has been, touch wood, a great success. Um, no ads, no sponsorship, which perhaps helps. And we, are, we do work at it very hard. I mean, we publish two new articles every day. We're probably completely mad. And now we have a team of about over a dozen people all around the world. So that has worked. But... Um, Maybe one help is that it started so long ago, so it's, it's had a long time to build up a head of steam. I'm sorry to hear that a lot of the blogs have stopped because that, that was quite healthy, really, to have as many voices as possible. You said some time ago that as a lifelong wine enthusiast that you were feeling increasingly under threat because the wine space was being encroached upon by craft beer, craft spirits and cocktails. Now, that was three years ago, I think. Has wine held its own in that time? In the UK, for the first time in my life, wine sales are slightly shrinking in terms of uh, volume. People are drinking better, so uh, average prices per bottle are going up, nudging up, uh, although they're still incredibly low compared to most of the wine that maybe we would be interested in. The no and low alcohol drinks, of course, are a huge growth area for obvious sort of health reasons. So I think we're work, having to work harder and harder to um, keep the wine flame really interesting. But once wine bites at somebody, then they do tend to get fairly interested and compulsive about it. It's fashion, isn't it? I mean, you know, I've been around so long, I've seen fashions come and go like sort of pendulums. But the threat, if you like, from other drinks is really keeping us on our toes, that's for sure. I've heard you say that you're always looking for value for your readers Absolutely. with the wines that you choose. What do you think, and I'm sure you get asked this question all the time, what do you think are some of the most underrated wine regions globally at the moment? Well, let's say underpriced, say, which is usually about the same thing as, as underrated. If you're looking for genuine value, I would say the Loire is still, with a few exceptions, sort of like cult wines, Clos Rougeard and stuff like that, uh, is underpriced. Beaujolais is a great place for Burgundy lovers to look uh, who can't afford Burgundy anymore. Prices are slowly nudging up there, but you can still get great value, and including wines that are being made like Burgundy and will eventually turn into something remarkably like Burgundy if you hang on to them. Although, personally, I'm a great fan of pure, early-drinking, gorgeous, refined uh, Beaujolais. Um, I think Greece is a great place for really interesting styles and flavours and uh, not particularly high prices. Uh, uh, we, every few months, hold um, a kind of a tasting night for visitors to jansensrollinson.com and we had a Greek wine night just before I left London. It was the most popular so far and there were some really fabulous wines there. I'm going to have a Portuguese one because Portugal is rather similar to Greece in that it's almost turned its back on international great varieties and has this huge array of its own with strong characters um, and not and with a few exceptions Portuguese table wine I think is underpriced for what it is. Um, Chile. Uh, Chile has been underpriced although I've just come from New York where there are signs that at long last faddy New Yorkers are noticing that there are some interesting wines coming out of Chile so I expect prices will rise but at the moment, I, I say Chile is a pretty good place to buy, certainly red wine. And South Africa is fantastic. The quality of wine being made in, by some, some of the new wave South Africans is absolutely first rate and not silly prices. I notice you haven't mentioned Australia in that list. <laughs> well, I assume you know so much more about Australia than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, not necessarily. You're attending the Chardonnay Symposium in this Yara, week. Yeah. And based on your recent columns, would it be fair to say that Chardonnay is the variety you're currently most excited about in Australia? Yeah, I think so. Uh, especially when compared with the 
European archetype, white burgundy, which is now zooming out of affordability. Uh, and, the, and Australian Chardonnay is so much more consistent and accessible than um, white burgundy. And, and it's so well made nowadays. So I'm really looking forward to the, the Chardonnay Symposium. And I saw you spoke particularly highly of, of Margaret River Chardonnay recently as well. Well, that was probably a bit tactless considering I'm, I'm on my way to the Yarra. But <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I will come away from the Yarra feeling fully enthused by Yarra Chardonnay. Speaking again about uh, JancisRobinson.com, I heard you say a few years ago that 85% of subscribers were men. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case? It's slightly a smaller proportion nowadays, but only slightly. It do, it's, it's very disappointing to me, um, but it does seem and, and if, uh, that it's a kind of male preoccupation. And if you look at the people who post on our forum, they're almost all male. Why is that, do you think? Mm, I don't know, because women seem to drink just as much wine as men. Are men just fundamentally more men, geeky well, and obsessive about things? I think things? there's that. I think, I think th there's a male gene that's fairly geeky and obsessive and perhaps a little bit more concerned with what they ought to like rather than what they actually like and the, um, you know, what their wine choices say about them. Whereas I always say, I think women have an easier time with wine to a certain extent because in my experience, they just drink what they like and, and aren't worried about whether it's the right bottle sort of thing. And also there is the unavoidable fact that men have more money than women. A wine obsession costs money. Now, as well as promoting the Atlas uh, while you're in Australia, you're also doing some events relating to the new glassware. Mm. Maybe you could tell me about how the glassware project came about. With pleasure. It's, it's something that I find myself involved with rather surprised because I never, ever had this in mind. You know, my currency is words and advice and opinion. But a very talented young British designer called Richard Brendan came to see me a couple of years ago and said he'd had great success with bone china and whiskey glasses and cocktail glasses and he now wanted to design wine glasses. But he realised he needed expert help for that and everybody he spoke to said he had to come and see me and someone introduced us. And I, it was so outside my thoughts that I'd sort of basically sent him away. I said, go and look at what's on the market now. But then he was very persistent and I thought to myself, well, I have actually got more than 40 years experience of tasting wine and I've got some very strong opinions on the ideal wine glass. My overriding opinion is that there is absolutely no need for a whole load of different glasses. And I've never understood why people pour white wine into a smaller glass than red wine because white wine is just as subtle and nuanced and benefits at least as much from air and space and, and all the rest. I was also encouraged to just come up with one glass by the fact that the champagne producers that I most respect, people like Jean-Baptiste Le Caillon at Roederer and, and the people at Krug and so forth, all want their champagnes to be tasted in wine glasses. They're fed up with these narrow little flutes that don't allow you to get much aroma and stuff. Also, top sherry producers like Jesus Barquin of Equipo Novasos and things like that, they want their fine sherries to be tasted in, in wine glasses. And as for the port producers, you know, you've got a could be a kind of 50 year old vintage port that's got so much nuance in it, and yet it's rammed into one of these tiny little thimbles, which is crazy. Alongside that, there's the fact that very, you know, you've got to own a chateau before you've got infinite shelf space. Most of us are counting the square inches. And then you've got the sort of Marie Kondo decluttering ethos. So everything was pointing towards just one wine glass, not least because if you break one, it's not a disaster, you know, it's not a sort of set. Um, and Richard took that on the chin, um, didn't sort of try and fight it, even though potentially it was narrowing the number of glasses that they would sell. Uh, and then he said, but I, I think, and so together, I sort of drew the perfect glass and came up with measurements and things. It was, uh, uh, but having encountered the gorgeous thinness of a Zalto glass at the rim, very, very thin, I couldn't go back. It, it had to be that thin, which meant that it had to be mouth blown. So it had to be a, an artisan product. 
Um, and so, but because I really, really don't enjoy polishing, washing and polishing glasses, it also had to be dishwasher proof. Uh, so we set about designing something that's a little bit, um, a little bit less tall than a Zalto Universal, so it fits into all dishwashers we've come across. And the stem is a little bit wider, so it's less fragile there, which tends to be the sort of breaking point. And um, I, was, I was the sort of major um, designer of the bowl. Sort of it's a more classical shape than the sort of angular Zalto, which I think looks fine in very uh, um, sort of Scandinavian or very modern settings, but not in all settings. But there's something about my shape which seems to encourage the aroma. And Richard has sort of refined the look of it. I think it looks gorgeous. It's very stable. Um, he found a, a Slovenian place where one team of four glass blowers could get it to the fineness that we were uh, seeking. But it's been such a success that they've had to train another three teams now. Um, and it's, it's great. I love drinking out of it. And um, I, I uh, you know, I go to all these tastings and sometimes the, the glasses are so sort of clunky. And I think once you've experienced that, that communing with the wine, you're, you almost feel there's nothing between you and the wine. It's very difficult to go back to a machine-made glass um, that is inevitably um, much thicker. What about this argument that, you know, different varieties need different shapes to deliver the wine onto a different place in the mouth? Well, that theory um, of physiology um, has been completely debunked now. You know, in theory, we had different bits of the tongue that were sensitive to different things, but... That old diagram yeah, with that, the yeah. grid on the, on the <laughs> tongue, yeah. No, that's gone. Um, so I, I, I don't think you can accept that. And um, the trouble with all those glasses that vary very slightly according to whether, you know, they're a central Otago Pinot Noir or a Mornington one or whatever, um, there's nothing on them that tells you which is which. So, and I, for one, have in my time been sent a whole load of different glasses, but I can never tell which one's meant for what. Then Richard Brendan said, but I think I'd like to design a decanter as well. And then I said, ah, but I don't believe there should be one decanter. I think there should be two decanters because there are two very different jobs you use a decanter for. One, the more common one, is for a young wine where you want to aerate it as much as possible. And he's come up with a really lovely one with a very wide open neck and that you can grasp and swoosh really easily. Um, that's the young wine decanter that you could get a magnum in. And I often put young whites in that actually, especially sort of young Chardonnays that can be quite tight. And I think white wine in a decanter looks even more beautiful than red wine in a decanter actually, because it, you know, golden and catches the light and all that. And then the old wine decanter is much, much narrower and has a stopper on the top. And that's for old wines that have a bit of a sediment and you just want to pour them off the sediment and then keep them protected from air. Am I allowed to ask you about your role in advising Queen Elizabeth <laughs> yeah. on her cellar? Yes, Tell me what's involved in that. Okay, I will. But, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, what, what sort of wines does the Queen like? She's not the greatest wine enthusiast. And so that's you know, not, not a, a profitable question. Uh, it involves, in fact, as soon as I get back home, um, we've got a meeting of the Royal Household Wine Committee. And they put out a tender for various wines, for various functions. And we go, there are about, there's me, Michel Roux Jr. Um, from the Gavroche, and then three mas um, wine merchants who represent wine merchants who have a royal warrant. Um, and then a f a f I think there are six of us on the committee. And we go in, not always all six of us there, and taste blind all the wines that have been submitted and then pool our thoughts and marks and um, basically just choose wine for the Queen to serve, either at great big receptions where the budget isn't enormous or at sort of fancier dinners. It's fun. The most fun bit really is uh, fighting your way through the crowds outside the railings at Buckingham Palace, you know, presenting your pass and crunching across the, the yard. And then the building itself is fun. You must know you've made it when you get that job. 
uh, it's a sort of childish pleasure. Um, but yes, it's. I, I once went. I went to the state banquet at Windsor when. Um, uh, What's his name? Sarkozy and Carla Bruni were the guests of honour. That was quite fun. One long table with, I think, 300 people at it or something, and lovely wines. That was fun. Robert Parker retired recently, and he's an industry figure that came in for a, a bit of criticism in the latter years of his career. What do you think will be his legacy? Well, he certainly, with the possible exception of Brett, was intolerant of poorly made wine. And so I think overall he increased the overall quality of wine, even if he had the effect of narrowing the range of styles of it, because um, he was a bit intolerant of, well, alternative varieties for a, for a start. He, I think he used to call them godforsaken grapes. And, um, because he was, I mean, he, he, he was criticized because he was so powerful, and he only became powerful because he was good at his job. He was incorruptible. He worked very hard, and the wine trade uh, used his scores mercilessly. And whereas actually, they, far too many of them gave up on their job, which was selecting wine and educating their customers about the wines, and just doled out his scores, which was pathetic, really. Um, so I think some of the criticism was was unjustified, but. Um, there was a parkerisation of wine and it wasn't very healthy and I'm very glad it's over. Do you think the days are over when one person could have that much influence on the wine world? I'm sure, and uh, I'm sure that's the case. And, and in fact, Parker came in at a time, at a perfect time when one person could have a lot of influence before, um, you know, Vivino came up or before there was a lot of, of user feedback. Now that the, the media landscape is completely different, I know that to earn my um, space, I have to, I have to um, be as, as accurate and as fair and as good as I possibly can be, but that, that I'm open to being criticized and people can write a comment and say, what rubbish? And you know, all in all, wine has been democratized and the consumer has far, far more voices, which is healthy. What about yourself? Um, what does the future hold for you? How many more editions of the Atlas do you think you've got in you? And... <laughs> uh, well, these books, are so, you know, both the Oxford Companion and the Atlas are such massive undertakings. Uh, the eighth edition of the World Atlas of Wine took me two solid years, which nowadays, given I spend so much time also doing JanicesRobinson.com and the Financial Times, I have no idea how I managed to find the time to do it. <laughs> Um, but I really don't feel at this moment like sitting down to do another big book. And I have already um, said to Julia Harding that I would like her to take over the prime responsibility of assembling the next fifth Oxford Companion to Wine. I'll certainly have an input, but um, I don't want that major prime responsibility. Um, and as for the ninth World Acts of Wine, well, rather... Worryingly, I've already started assembling a little list of new elements I think it should have in it. But um, I do, it, I'm far too tired of the eighth to think about starting it now. Are you someone that is always going to have to keep working in wine? I love it. I mean, I don't have to do it. All the children have grown up long ago, no, no school bills. And, um, uh, so I must like it. I, must, I, I do it because I love it. And yes, I think I... I would be sad. I can't imagine retirement. There's nothing I would rather do than, than write about wine and do a bit of travel. What do you drink when you're not drinking wine? Water, tea, not very good at spirits. The occasional cocktail with a high acid, con you know, a margarita I can handle. You have spent some time in Japan this year. Yes, though, sake believe. is fun. Sake is a little um, overwhelming for me because I do know quite a lot about wine, and I can see that there is as much to learn about sake as about wine, but I haven't got another 40 years to do it in. So I'm a bit scared of sake, but I love it. Um, and I'm not, beer, you know, on a hot day, I sort of have two gulps, and I think that's wonderful, and then it all gets a bit much. I sort of very rarely finish a glass of beer, I'm afraid, which must seem very foreign to any Australian man. But. <laughs> well, probably English too, I would have thought. <laughs> yes. 
Um, no, it's tea, water, and wine in the uh, reverse order, probably. Well, Jancis, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast and a real honour. So thanks so much for joining me and I hope you have a wonderful time in Australia. Thanks very much. Thank you. The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.